nice to meet you, Amor Lovins. Welcome to Almedalsvikan. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know that you have studied Sweden's energy policy for quite some time. About uh, 50 years. Yeah. About 50 years, yeah, well, quite some time. <laughs> and also followed the recent debate closely. Um, what's your impression of the current debate on energy in Sweden? It reminds me of the 1970s. Yeah. Uh, in several ways. Uh, first, that it's all about supply. Uh, overlooking that despite the great improvements in efficiency of using energy, most of it is still wasted. So we could save at least half, probably two thirds, maybe more, uh, cheaper than any kind of supply. So and right now, this is an especially lucrative thing to do with, with prices high for mm. some years to come. Uh, <clears throat> then the debate also happens to fall in an election season. Uh, which brings forth, forward uh, issues that can be used to score political points. Uh, so I think the nuclear part of the conversation is really just political theater. It can't possibly be a serious energy policy uh, for, and, well, for several obvious reasons, that the reactors cost several times more than the, the proponents say they do. Uh, it's just a matter of observing market mm. prices uh, <clears throat> rather than fantasies or what ifs or should be's. Uh, it's too slow to deal with our security and climate uh, issues. And uh, actually having no business case uh, because it's so expensive, new reactors would make climate change worse by displacing less fossil fuel for chrono. Uh, we're talking, of course, not only about Sweden, which is essentially mm. decarbonized power, but also neighboring countries to which Sweden exports power and that use it to displace fossil fuel. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the nuclear conversation in Sweden is surprisingly not very well informed. It's attracted a lot of fake studies, bad analysis, uh, assumptions that have very tenuous relation to reality. Mm. And so as a student of that subject for 50 years or so, I, I'm surprised because Sweden has many brilliant engineers and uh, I'm actually a member of, a former member of, of EVA, so I get to meet some of them that way. Uh, and uh, in both the forgetting about efficiency uh, and the nuclear emphasis throw us back 50 years. We, we really need to bring the, the conversation mm. up to date. So actually in the world now, about 95% of the net additions of generating capacity are renewable. Uh, nuclear is a fraction of a percent of the increased electric supply in a good year, but in most years it goes down uh, because it's dying of an incurable attack of market mm. forces. This is really at a stage of rather advanced uh, slow motion Mm. collapse all over the world. But do you regard nuclear power having any part of the transition, the solution of the transition of energy? Well, I can't find a case where there's a business argument for actually building it. Uh, it uh, the and, and even the existing reactors, until the anomalously high prices from Putin's war, uh, were struggling to survive in a mm. competitive market. They, some years they'd make money, many years they'd lose money. And they were shut down for that reason. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it really deserves an orderly terminal phase. The technology served us well for a time, but now it's obsolete because much better and several fold cheaper mm. uh, alternatives have come along. Uh, and even though Energy uh, Kosh uh, assumes very low nuclear costs and rather high future renewable costs compared to actual market prices, uh, they still find that renewables are several fold cheaper. Mm. And does this also apply to the so-called fourth generation of nuclear? Yes, 
reactor too? Uh, yeah, there's no change in technology or size of reactor that can change the result. And the, the small modular reactors uh, distraction is the latest sort of shiny object to be waved in front of us by the same people who brought us the previous failures. But uh, it is it is not possible that small modular reactors will have a business case either. Because reactors, as a matter of physics, mm. don't scale down well, they will produce costlier electricity initially by roughly twofold than today's reactors do. Today's reactors are at least several fold and in world data, three to 13 fold more expensive per kilowatt hour uh, than renewables uh, unsubsidized. And those renewables in turn will be twofold cheaper still by the time you could build enough mm, okay. small modular reactors to find out about them. So let's see, two times three to 13 times two, that's a factor between 12 and 50 odd. Uh, mm. There's no way that mass production could reach yeah. that that gap. This is just magical arithmetic. Yeah, it sounds really well, yeah. And how come, why do you think that Swedish, Sweden politicians and, and, and other in the, in debate in Sweden now promote nuclear energy once again? It's, well, I think it's partly because they believe uh, a particular very zealous but not reliable nuclear advocate. Uh, but I, I think it's really just the election season that brings out any issue that can be used uh, to score political points. Mm. Uh, but there are two very strange things about this in Swedish politics now. Uh, uh, one, of course, is that the people who propose nuclear power are not proposing to pay for it and don't have a way to pay for it. It's way out of money. Mm. And second, uh, the things you would have to do to force it to be built are profoundly anti-market, statist, and actually against the interests of the industries that are those parties' main mm. allies and partners. Uh, so, this tension or contradiction between political philosophy uh, and professed methods uh, would, I think, not work at all. Mm. And all we're seeing at the moment is political theater. Mm. So, if the if the more conservative parties win the election, we will quickly see that their energy policy isn't feasible and is uh, would be opposed by most of the industry that couldn't stand the costly mm. power uh, that would make them very uncompetitive. Uh, and if they don't win the election, it, it all goes past anyway. Mm. And I know that you, you often stress the need for investing in, in other options, uh, uh, apparently, uh, and you often talk about cheap, fast and sure options. And, and what are these options? Oh, well, there are, are you basic, basically two kinds, certainly for our energy security, health, prosperity, and, uh, <coughs> climate protection. We need options that are uh, fast, cheap, and uh, sure rather than slow, costly, and speculative. So the, the two categories we should be emphasizing uh, are efficient use uh, and uh, renewable supply reliably integrated into the grid. And we have about 10 ways to do that. That don't, one of which, the costliest of which is big batteries, and they work fine and they can make money, but they're not the cheapest method. Uh, and you don't actually need them if you do the others. Okay. And as you mentioned, we have national elections coming up. Uh, if you would be the next Minister of Energy in Sweden, what would your first measures be? Well, I, I think I would first uh, make sure that energy efficiency is competed or compared against supply every time we were making an investment mm. decision so that we choose the best buys first. Uh, Sweden is one of the most efficient countries uh, one of the 70-odd I work in, and I was one of the first I worked in in the 70s through 90s. Uh, and it's very innovative in technology and in policy. 
uh, but we seem to have not just learning curves, but forgetting curves. Uh, the whole public conversation is only about supply. Uh, the, the supply becomes easier, faster, cheaper, whatever it is, uh, if we first save at least half our energy, uh, probably two thirds and quite possibly more than that. Uh, I teach at Stanford and hope to teach in Sweden. Uh, there's interest here in that. Uh, a way of designing buildings, factories, vehicles as whole systems for multiple benefits that makes the energy saving resource several fold bigger than had been thought, but also cheaper and often with increasing returns. And it's like renewables, the more you buy, the cheaper it gets, so you buy more so it gets cheaper. Uh, I live in a Normand uh, climate at 2,200 meters mm -hmm. elevation near Aspen, Colorado. We do with altitude what you do with latitude. Uh, and the temperature where, where I live used to go to minus 44 Celsius yeah. in 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. But in, inside our house, we're, we just harvested our 80th passive solar banana crop with no, right, heating, yeah. no heating system, and it's cheaper to build that way. So now uh, there are techniques uh, coming to Sweden that can uh, add super insulation around the outside of your old house or apartment so that it doesn't need heat uh, and will use no more total energy than it produces hmm. over the year. Uh, and that can be cost effective now. And hopefully not for bananas, yeah. That's no, so yeah. of course, if we focus that on the older, like 70s and before buildings that are quite poorly insulated yeah. and often electrically heated, uh, that would help reduce the seasonality of the electric load in Sweden, where now the peak load in winter is almost twice the normal load in summer. Um, that's because of electrically mm. heated inefficient buildings. Mm. Uh, there are surprisingly many savings even in Swedish industry. Uh, one that was realized by uh, Jon Eriksson in 1870, I think, is that we can make pipes fat, short, and straight rather than thin, long, and crooked mm. and save 80 to 90 odd percent of the friction and therefore the pumping energy. The same for fans. Well, pumps and fans are half the motor energy. Motors use half the electricity. so. This is rather important. If everybody in the world did this, we could save about a fifth of the uh, total electric use. Mm. And typically, you get your money back uh, from these improvements in less than a year in old installations and instantly in new ones. Mm. But this isn't in any engineering textbook or government study or industry forecast or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology, mm. it's, it's a design method. Yeah. And few people yet think of design as a way to uh, scale things quickly. So I think, mm. as, as minister, I would I would focus uh, particularly on efficient use, and then let the supply compete fairly at honest prices. Mm. Uh, and uh, I would focus also on what's called barrier busting. That is, there are sixty or eighty market failures in buying energy efficiency. Uh, and uh, each of them can be turned into a business mm. opportunity. Okay, let's hope the next uh, Ministry of Energy listens to you and also stressing the uh, energy I've efficiency. I've advised many before, matters. and, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, I always find that ministers and prime ministers are starved for information, they're eager to know what's going on out there that the advisors aren't telling them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for taking your time talking to me. You're yeah. welcome. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>